that's okay. I think I can I can bend. I'm not that This is adjustable here, so you can turn that down towards you when you're ready. So uh, welcome everybody to Cafe Historique. Can you hear me in the back? Is the volume okay? Yes? Yes, okay, great. So uh, hello, uh, my name is John Lutz. I uh, teach in the History Department at the University of Victoria. And normally, uh, Dr. Jill Walshaw would be introducing the speaker today, but she is the speaker today, so I have the privilege and the pleasure of introducing my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jill Walshaw, who is an associate professor in the History Department at the University of Victoria. Um, Jill has a mischievous streak to her, I would say. And so that sort of explains why she likes to study people who are doing acting badly, basically, misbehaving. And so she has, um, uh, her first book is uh, about kind of seditious behavior in the, in the French regime. She studies 17th and 18th century France. And she's working on another book, and you're going to hear sort of a part of that book today about other people, mischievous or bad behaving people who um, are trying to topple the French state by putting a few, a few um, uh, leaden coins in their pocket and spreading them around. So um, what else can I tell you about Jill? Well, she's the organizer of the series this year and in previous years, so, uh, and that's, uh, that's turned out to be a, a big job, so we can thank us. A round of applause for our organizer of the Café Historique. Um, she teaches an amazing variety of courses. You might imagine she teaches courses on uh, the, fr the French Revolution and, and France in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, but she also teaches some kind of really creative courses, one on the history of money, so um, she's, you know, this speaks into, or she's going to speak into that. She teaches a course which, which actually became a theme for Café Historique a few years ago. She teaches a course called Backpacker's Guide to Europe. And, uh, and um, I don't know if you can audit that course or not, but uh, yeah, people can audit that course. But anyway, it became a theme for Café Historique um, uh, one year. Um, she teaches a course on utopias. She teaches a course on... Um, trials. And on trials, uh, yeah, also more on bad behavior. <laughs> so um, uh, so um, I think uh, that's probably enough. Uh, maybe I'll let you know that she... Um, did her a master's degree in France. She did her PhD in England. She's been here since 2008, see? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and she's also our honors advisor. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jill Walshaw. To that was a great uh, introduction, considering that John uh, found out about three minutes ago that he was going to introduce me. So, um, because I was thinking, oh, I'll just introduce myself, and they said, no, no, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. So, um, okay. So I, uh, I'm looking. You can't hear me. Thank you. Is that better? That's going to be better. Okay. But then it's kind of in my way. Hold on. Um. <laughs> they weren't that good. <laughs> we'll leave them alone. All right. So I'm going to start this talk with a story, okay? So here's, a, here's, our, here's our counterfeiters. On January 21st, 1783, French police raided a ramshackle dwelling in the woods uh, near Saint-Didier, which is a, a southwestern town near Toulouse, and they arrested five people. Pierre Gerbier, uh, a woman, uh, Marianne Morin, and their three children. They had been tipped off to the pair's location in the woods by merchants who accused them of using false coins in the marketplace. One witness said that the youngest of the children had tried to buy bread using counterfeit pennies. Indeed, at their encampment, authorities found a whole setup which they strongly suspected had been used to falsify the coins. There was a makeshift forge, there were tongs and crucibles, there was lots of sand, there were files, and most incriminatingly, there were pieces of tin and lead and a handful of cheap coins that had been made from them. Seeing the writing on the wall, perhaps, Pierre threw his family on the mercy of the court. Yes, he confessed, he had made the coins. Unfortunately, their luck then took a turn for the worse. Pierre was trained as an ironmonger, but he'd fallen on tough times, and these days he was peddling little bits of metal, other knickknacks and things like that to make, things, make, uh, make ends meet. His partner, Marianne, was a beggar, and she sent her children to beg for the family as well. So learning this information was actually bad for them. The court petitioned to have their case transferred to a summary justice court, which dealt with the marginal population. And the children were placed in the care of the local church. Their trial was short. Marianne was to serve a five-year prison sentence, which was actually very, very lenient for the time. And Pierre was sent to the galleys for nine years. Now, admittedly, 
This kind of scenario is perhaps not what you imagined when you heard that I was going to be talking about counterfeiting. Probably you're thinking of, you know, big time, modern day operations with hundred dollar bills, right? Things like these, these are the images we think of when we think of counterfeiters, right? Uh, using printers. <laughs> or you're thinking about, you know, the police work, right? The discoveries, the kind of investigations that might go on into counterfeiting today. Or maybe you're thinking about the perpetrators, people that we might see in the news. I have to admit, when I was looking at these pictures, I thought, I wonder if this is what my people looked like, <laughs> <laughs> my 17th and 18th century criminals. Um, I ran across this by chance, actually, when I was looking to report a suspicious person in my neighborhood. Apparently, if you witness someone using counterfeit currency, you can report it online to VicPD. <laughs> so if that happens to you, go here. Um, and this story, actually ran five years ago in the Victoria News. A Vancouver man was passing off these bills in Victoria and getting Canadian change for them. How were they recognized, you might ask? Look at the wording. So instead of the United States of America, it reads World Universal Bank Limited. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure why you would change that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure why you would put that if you had the printer and you could, you know, leave it with the United States of America. That you'd think that would be smarter, but you know, criminals get caught. So, um, so this is what we think of today, right? But counterfeiting is as old as money, and I heard some of you talking about that earlier before the talk. Um, and by the way, hundreds of years ago, there were smart counterfeiters and dumb counterfeiters too. There were some who would have done this. Um, so in my talk today, I'm going to be giving you an overview of my work on counterfeiters. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to correct some of these, these false impressions that we might have about the crime and about its history. First, however, we need to go back a few thousand years. So I teach a course at the University of Victoria on the history of money. It's a first year course, and it gets roughly one third history students, one third economic students, and one third business students. <laughs> And the economics and business students are always a little shocked when I start with this. They think, wow, we are really going back to the beginning. <laughs> so I use these images from a kid's book uh, to make it fun for them. And so as you can see here, we imagine uh, that in hunter-gatherer societies, early exchange would have happened by barter. Okay? People would gradually specialize in their crafts. One person would be get, get better at making knives. One person would get better at you know, finding good herbs to eat. And then they would trade for other objects. But the problem with barter is that it requires, <coughs> excuse me, it requires what economists call a double coincidence of wants, okay? So that means that you want what I have and I want what you have and we both want it at the same time and we want it in quantities that make sense, okay? So in this picture, for my students, the goat farmer wants to swap for grain but the grain farmer doesn't want a goat. So here's the problem, they do not have a double coincidence of wants, what to do? Presenting, the exchange token. So an exchange token is an intermediary, right? It's an object that acts as a medium of exchange, kind of like money, that's where I'm going. So in this case, it resolves the goat farmer's problem, okay? So now the goat farmer can exchange his goat for an exchange token, and he knows that others will accept that exchange token in return. For example, the grain farmer might want that exchange token. So the grain farmer is happy to sell his grain for this exchange token, and then he goes and he buys what it is he really wants, which turns out to be a pig. So, problem solved. In these cartoons, the exchange token looks suspiciously like a little bag of gold, okay? But it could be a bag of grain, it could be a bag of shells, it could be anything, in fact. An exchange token can be anything that people are willing to accept and that fills the purpose as a medium of exchange. So in history and around the world, a huge number of objects have been used as exchange tokens. So on the bottom left here, we have kissy pennies from Liberia. Next to them, we have salt bars from Ethiopia, uh, cattle in the Near East and in Africa, tobacco leaves, wampum belts here in North America. And the two most widely spread exchange tokens are shown here too, cowry shells and grain, all right? But not all exchange tokens worked equally well. For example, they had to be convenient, okay? They had to be easy to store, easy to transport. They had to have what we call a high value density. So for um, a, a normal kind of payment, you have to be able to make the payment without hauling around giant bags of grain, for example. They also have to be easily divisible into smaller denominations. So grain works well for this, cowrie shells work well for this, not so much with cows. Can't really pay with half a cow, right? 
And they had to be relatively rare, and they had to be not easily counterfeited. So cowrie shells, for example, rare in some areas, worked less well as an exchange token in areas where they were very readily available on the beaches. Wampum belts, another example, uh, became less valuable when English settlers brought metal tools to speed up making the beads out of the shells, and then they became less valuable because they represented less labor. So as a result, exchange tokens that met more of these criteria were used more widely. And gradually, one ideal exchange token emerged, pieces of gold and silver bullion. So precious metals met all of these criteria. They were broadly acceptable. They were broadly desired. Everyone recognized their value. They were easy to store, easy to transport, easy to divide into smaller quantities, and unlike grain or cows, they didn't spoil. So some of our earliest evidence of the use of money from Mesopotamia, uh, the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, around 2000 BC, shows the weighing out of pieces of gold and silver. You can see the gold rings here. Um, and at first, merchants carried their own scales, and then gradually, religious institutions became the centers of business. So you would go to the temple to have your silver weighed. Uh, priests would weigh out your money, and they would give you a record uh, of what you had had on a clay tablet. Incidentally, this is the origin of the bank. These Mesopotamian temples also started taking deposits, issuing loans, and providing us records as historians and archaeologists of those records. This is also, by the way, the reason we talk about gold in weight of grains. We talk about a certain number of grains of gold because at the time, grain was the most common exchange token in the area, and so when they started you know, estimating a certain weight of gold, it was done in grains. I'm not sure what kind of grain, actually. It looks a little bit like kasha. Eventually, to avoid having to weigh and re-weigh the silver pieces, some temples started issuing silver bars with the weight stamped on them already. So it's not far from here, obviously, to actual coins. Coins are merely pieces of metal that are marked with a design that allow you to see quickly what weight and value you're, you're holding in your hand. The use of coins speeds up commerce. It gives people confidence, and everyone can use them. Don't forget, at this time, 99.9% .9 of people are illiterate, right? So a symbol, a number of dots that shows the denomination, for example, can tell people what they have. The earliest coins that we know of are these ones pictured here. They're from about 650 BC, and they're from the kingdom of Lydia, which today is part of modern-day Turkey, sort of Western Turkey. Um, and they're made of electrum, which is interesting. It's a naturally occurring blend of silver and gold. Um, they actually stopped using electrum after a while because it was, it was hard to know the exact balance of the silver and gold, but that was what the earliest coins were made out of. So as the use of coinage spreads and evolves, the markings become more sophisticated, as we know, right? They come from emblems of authority or political identity, something like, you know, a fort or a symbol, such as the city of Athens in the Greek Empire used the owl for Athena, right? Um, and then eventually we get to portraits of rulers, inscriptions of political authority. This happens especially with Alexander the Great and then going into the Roman Empire. So the value of the coin is determined by two things here. It's determined by the intrinsic value of the precious gold and silver that it contains, and it's determined by the strength of the government and the economy that backs it. Okay, those two things are really important. I'm going to keep coming back to them. So people accepted coins in exchange for their goods, partly because they knew that others would also accept those coins in exchange for their goods when the time came to spend them. And partly because, like exchange tokens of grain or salt or tobacco or uh, metal, um, there's an intrinsic value to the material, right? So it feels good to accept a gold coin because if worse comes to worse, you could melt it down, right? It's still gold, right? There's something intrinsic about that. So the evolution from this to this represents the biggest shift of all in the history of money, right? We go from commodity money over here money where the object can be a commodity in itself, right? The gold can be a commodity with intrinsic value to what we call fiduciary money. So fiduciary money is money where the value comes from our faith in its value, right? From the Latin, fides, faith. So that paper, or plastic, has no intrinsic value, right? We can't melt it down, we can't use it for anything else, we can't build a house with it. Um, if the state backing it fails, if the economy backing this piece of paper fails tomorrow, then it will be worth nothing, 
right? So there's no intrinsic value there. And of course, we're in the midst of another stage of evolution, right? Uh, to virtual currencies like Bitcoin, uh, where we only see our resources on the screen of our computers and where the value can go up and down like the stock market. So for my talk today, we're going to be focusing on this era of currency, right? Coinage that is based on precious metal content and whose value is guaranteed by a strong centralized state. In this case, the absolutist kingdom of France in the 18th century before the French Revolution. So when counterfeiters tried to pass off cheap copies, they were undermining that value in a way that was even more tangible than a fake 20 would feel to us today, right? Because it's not just the, the state that's backing it that's being undermined, it's also the intrinsic value of the object that is being undermined. So before we see how counterfeit co coins were made, uh, we need to understand the process of making authentic coins, because this is a long time before the first automated coin press. This is a laborious process with many stages. So the employees of the mint uh, start by preparing a flan, so a blank, okay, um, in the correct weight and shape of the coin. The precious metal content for each coin is highly regulated. The mixture is always an alloy, um, and it always has a specified amount of copper mixed in. Uh, no coins were ever completely silver or gold, even way back when. Um, and then the component materials are carefully weighed before being melted, and then the mixture is formed into blanks. Okay. Next, the blanks are going to undergo a process of cleaning, what they call blanchiment. Uh, they use chemicals like ammonia, like alum, uh, and they're basically removing some of the surface impurities that would have come from melting the metals. Once they're ready to be imprinted, the blanks are heated briefly in a furnace to make them more malleable. And then they're imprinted using a mechanical screw press. And I'll show you a bigger picture of that in a second. So the stamping block, or the die, uh, has the averse design on one side, and it's fitted to one part of the screw press, and the reverse design on the other side, and it's fitted to the other part of the screw press. So here you can see those, those sort of octagonal blocks here. There's one embedded down here and one here, and he's about to put the blank in between. And then the pendulum turns the screw, which applies enough pressure to permanently imprint the designs for the dies on the blank. A basket of blanks can be seen over here on the left, and those that are finished over here in a basket on the right. Uh, this is actually quite a small screw press. Um, the original designs of these actually had f two pendulums, so two, um, like four places to hang on, and they had horses that pulled them. So initially they were, they were very big contraptions. Even these ones, you can see, they kind of have ropes, and so the idea is you'd grab them and you'd whip it around, and it would, be, it would apply a lot of force. You can do it much, much more, um, more efficiently now. So the technicians who made these coins were employed by the state, okay? So they're subject to all kinds of verification processes, certification, all kinds of intense scrutiny of their, of their work. So for example, only official die carvers were authorized to make the dies, the stamps that have the design for the coin. Unauthorized possession of those dies was actually grounds for suspicion for counterfeiting because there was no reason why you would have them. Um, in fact, so was unauthorized possession of any of this material, the crucible, the chemicals, any of it. It was all associated with money making. Um, in addition, the use of the screw press, this sort of machine, was made mandatory in 1645 because the previous method, which was just hand striking, right, just having the dies and just whacking it with a hammer, that produced quite a bit of variation even in official coins. So some mints that were still using the, the hammer method, um, they, would, they were creating a lot of variations among acceptable coins. And in some ways, that undermined the government's attempt to crack down on counterfeiters because it meant that the public was quite used to seeing variations. So then it was, it was harder to detect the counterfeits. So this actually becomes regulated in the mid-17th century. So despite all the controls and regulations uh, in place, counterfeiting coins was feasible enough that a large number of people tried their hand at it. Um, Fausse money or false money was an umbrella term that applied to a variety of fakes um, from sophisticated copies to coins that had simply been tampered with. It all had to do with skill level. Uh, not everyone had the technical wherewithal to master the entire process. Uh, for example, some coins were simply clipped or they were sort of, you know, 
some way lightened of a little bit of their burden of silver and gold. Um, and then those, those shavings or those clippings would be gathered up carefully, maybe melted down to be sold or to be used for something else. Uh, coins could also be filed, um, and there's even uh, references to churning coins or sweating coins, which meant to put them in a bag and shake them around and hope that you got a little bit of gold dust off them in the bottom of the bag. No evidence in that I found that this worked very well, but I think desperate times, right? Um, so in order to prevent this kind of cheating, clipping in particular, they invented this machine, this edge design machine, which was to imprint, uh, sorry, you can see the little dots, what they call grenetti in French, and you know the British pound today still has designs around the edge of it, right? Um, so that greatly reduced the number of clipped coins in circulation. But counterfeiters had other tricks up their sleeves, as you can imagine. So those with a little bit more technical competence tried to produce coins where the outer surface was true, but the inner core was made of cheaper metal. So for example, coins made of copper were plated with silver or with gold. Um, today, fakes like this that have survived um, are obvious because the outer layer is broken down. So as historians, we look at them and say, well, <laughs> why would that have passed? That's really obviously, you know, fake. But at the time, the, the, the layer would have, uh, would have held up for a while. Um, you would have had to clip it or punch it or scrape it in some way to try to determine what was inside. Um, they also had this other method of plating that was really um, sophisticated called fire gilding, where you um, mixed gold and mercury together, and then you rubbed that over the coin, and then the mercury would evaporate. And so it's much more expensive to do it this way, but the gold that remained would be really, really firmly bonded to the copper. And so that was one way they did it. So in common parlance of counterfeiters, um, these coins were described as fourré, so filled, or uh, plaqué, plated, or my favorite, which is saucé, which actually means like with a sauce on them. So I've translated that as dipped <laughs> or, or coated or something like that. So others experimented with uh, cutting out the precious metals altogether and treating cheaper metals uh, like copper with chemicals so that they would look like silver or look like gold. So this image is a recipe that I found in the archives for whitening copper. Uh, and it's included among the pieces of evidence against a group of counterfeiters outside of Lyon in eastern France. So it calls for eau forte, eau forte here, so aqua fortis or, uh, or nitric acid, uh, a quantity of silver threads, mercury, and my favorite, a pinch of antimony. So everyone has antimony in their kitchen, right? <laughs> um, in fact, whitened copper uh, is among the most common type of coin that's mentioned in the trials. So we see a lot of people using chemical baths to whiten uh, cheaper metals. Um, sometimes defendants would be accused of taking tokens, like, like, a, like a commemorative coin or a fairground token or something like that, and whitening it. Or they would just take really low denomination um, copper coins and try to, try to whiten those. The recipes themselves are quite rare in the archives. We don't get a lot of these, but this was a, this was a great find. Uh, finally, uh, those counterfeiters with the most technical skill tried to replicate the entire process. So from blanks to imprinting with a press, but they were mixing their own concoction of precious metals, but using cheaper components like lead and tin and copper, maybe a small amount of gold and silver to, to make the blend work. So just like in the process at the Royal Mint, they had to somehow imprint their blanks. Uh, some would use carved dies, um, like we saw with the screw press. They would either steal them from the mint or they would buy them from an unscrupulous mint worker. Some of them got caught for that. Uh, or they carved them themselves if they had that skill. After that, they probably would have used the hand striking method, but some did actually have workshops where they had, uh, they had small screw presses in operation. In more amateur operations, we see them using molds. So uh, an impression would be made of a legitimate coin, um, usually in plaster, sometimes in sand, if it was really amateur. Um, and, uh, and then they would pour their metal into this mold. Now, the criminals that they caught, whose interrogations I'm reading in the archives, right? They're probably not the most skilled at counterfeiting coins. I mean, after all, these are the ones that got caught. So I always think to myself, there's probably a lot of really great counterfeit coins out there that, that weren't getting caught, right? But these are the ones that we have to deal with. And you have to, you have to think that people were good at detecting them. So, um, But counterfeiting was a major concern to the French crown, to the government. Uh, there are mountains of legal treatises describing it. There are dozens of trials in the courts. So let's turn to that now. First of all, how it was understood by the government and how they worked to track down the perpetrators. 
Now, if we think back to the early emergence of coins, right, they had legitimacy, remember, in the eyes of the public for two reasons. They had intrinsic value for the gold and silver, and they were guaranteed by political authority. So counterfeit coins are undermining those criteria. First of all, they're cheating the public. They're passing off a, a cheap piece of metal instead of gold or silver. And they're cheating the ruler by undermining his authority to issue currency. So today, we consider counterfeiting to be an economic crime, a crime of fraud, right? Um, but in 18th century France, where the government was the personal domain of one individual, the absolute monarch, appointed by God, counterfeiting was a crime of treason. Okay, this is undermining his legitimacy to rule. It's actually classified as les majesté, an attack on the majesty of the sovereign. Um, and les majesté encompasses a wide variety of crimes. There's les majesté, there's divine les majesté, which includes blasphemy and sacrilege and things like that. Uh, plotting on the king's life is les majesté. Counterfeiting actually falls under one of the secondary categories of les majesté, it wasn't a direct attack on the monarchy, but it threatened the economic viability of the state, right? Sort of the lifeblood of that monarch, and that was how it was considered. Um, and it undermined his prerogative to issue currency, which if we think back to, you know, the, the, the kings of, you know, the medieval period when they were sort of establishing their kingdoms, the right to mint coins, that prerogative, that's really foundational to their political power. It's one of the identifiers of, of political power. Um, and so, Counterfeiters are illegally reproducing his image, right? Historians have actually shown um, how inanimate objects frequently stood in for the presence of the king in this kind of society. For example, when Louis XIV was absent from the palace, it was a crime to wear a hat in the room where the royal table was set. It was a crime to turn your back on his portrait because when he was absent, those items actually stood in for his royal presence. So it was like you were wearing a hat in his presence or you were turning your back on him. Of all of these objects, coins top the list, right? They bear the image of the king. And in the case of the Louis d'Or, this coin, the golden Louis, it actually bears his name as well. So royal sovereignty is being personified in the metal object itself. So as a result, it's taken very seriously. Um, like other forms of les majesté, it's punishable by death. Uh, usually this was by hanging. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> usually it was by hanging. Um, if you were a noble, you got to be beheaded. That was your, uh, that was your, your, your uh, advantage of being a noble. Uh, but up until the 1600s, actually the official penalty for counterfeiting was being boiled alive. Um, legislators had this devilish sense of sort of eye for an eye justice. Um, in the later medieval period, many penalties were supposed to be sort of tailored to fit the crime. They sort of kind of reenacted the crime. So the phrase goes, I wrote it down, just as the counterfeiter boils his evil concoction of base metals, so too shall he be boiled to death. <laughs> it's actually in legislative texts. Um, the Parliament of Brittany actually has um, records of ordering a cauldron for this particular purpose. You know, it's, it's within their expenses. Um, and you might think that the move from boiling alive to hanging was out of humanitarian considerations. It wasn't. It was actually for practical reasons, because it's expensive to have a big cauldron sitting around. And, you know, you've got to build a big fire and get the water going and everything. It's much cheaper to just hang people. So in 1604, we read that a certain condemned party would be hanged, quote, given the lack of an available cauldron or other means to execute them appropriately. I'm sure he was very relieved. <laughs> so we get a sense of how serious the crown was about this by some of the rhetoric in the laws. So for example, one court in the southwestern town of Perigueux concludes a 1769 trial with the words, a crime like this which attacks the authority of the prince and which is detrimental to the public demands a resounding punishment. And they went on to pronounce the death sentence in that case. And another court in Brittany in 1770 wrote, after the interrogation, the prisoner had to have known that the king's coin is a sacred thing and that no one has the right to make imitate or distribute it falsely. If they did, they were committing the crime of les majesty. So what's interesting to me here, and this is one of the reasons why I got into the project, is despite this apparent gravity, right, this seriousness with which this is taken, most of the counterfeiting in the 18th century was relatively small scale, okay? Um, its practitioners were down on their luck. They were looking for some financial gain. Um, they were not trying to undermine the state. 
Um, I don't mean to suggest that a serious counterfeiting operation, even if it's run by a bunch of peasants, um, couldn't be damaging in a material way, but the rhetoric of the law here seems a little bit out of touch to me with the reality of the crime, which as we consider it today is essentially a, a fraud, right? It's a crime, it's an economic crime. So there's a degree of irony, I think, in the prosecution of a small time coin clipper who's maybe done it once, um, caught up in the state machinery that's been designed for much, much greater threats. But state machinery there was, everything from judges and magistrates who tried the perpetrators in the court system, to city councillors who investigated complaints, to the mounted police who roamed the countryside watching for ne'er-do-wells at fairs and marketplaces who might be trying to pass off counterfeit coins. Um, detective work was nowhere near as sophisticated then as it is today. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that. Um, but there's a certain charm to these old world investigators. You know, they don't have forensic science, they don't even have lie detectors, and they have all of these methods for sort of getting at the truth. Um, I actually don't have any uh, slides about torture. I don't really have any pictures of torture. We could talk about, we could talk about torture in the question section. Um, so for a long time, scholars thought of these guys, the Marie Chaussée, the rural mounted police, as undermanned, ineffective, underpaid, um, but that impression came mostly from complaints about them and from requests for additional funding. <laughs> so you can imagine how that impression uh, was, was reached. Um, I remember reading when I was a graduate student, for example, that the mounted police were less than committed to their jobs because of the inadequacy or absence of salaries, <laughs> like the absence of salaries, um, and the fact that they had to supply their own horse. So that sort of cut down the number of people who were willing to do it. Um, However, from what I've seen in this research project, um, their work tracking down counterfeiters and arresting them suggests that they were actually very effective. Uh, they conducted searches of houses, um, searches of suspects. They knew exactly what to look for in terms of equipment and chemicals. And they were very methodical, very professional when they presented their findings to the court. So um, as much as these guys look like a couple of yahoos, um, it actually was quite a, quite a sophisticated system. Um, just an aside here, um, because working in the archives is so much fun. In investigators logged all kinds of material evidence with trials, and some of it remains in the archives alongside the documents. So these are just a few items that I've sort of taken photographs of over the years. On the left, we have evidence in a trial against a woman for theft of fabric. I think it's fascinating that they didn't return the fabric to the person from whom it had been stolen. It stayed in the trial for 300 years. Um, here we have a knife that police identified as the murder weapon used by uh, Jean Bouy in, uh, in Toulouse. Um, and underneath the document here, I don't know if you can see it very well, this is a burlap bag. So this is the traditional way in which the Supreme Courts would keep all of the trial documents together. They literally had a burlap bag with a little label stitched to the outside and the person's name written on it. And all of everything was folded and shoved into the bag, including apparently this knife. Um, here are two more. Uh, so feathers apparently kept for more than 200 years uh, from a trial of theft of chickens. Th you know, they look so fresh. I, I couldn't help but think maybe the archivist just replaced them every couple of years just for fun <laughs> because like, they really, they, they're not degraded at all. Um, and on the right, the belongings of a prisoner who was executed, so two combs and a notebook. Of course, for me, the most exciting things to find in the archives are actual counterfeit coins. And I found quite a few that are connected with trial documents. Um, I'm showing two different trials here, left and right. So on the left, um, these two coins on the bottom left were inside this little paper packet, which says four coins on it, uh, the archivist wrote on. Um, and on the right, as soon as I pulled this stack of papers out of the box, the fact that this coin was within its little plastic sleeve uh, was immediately apparent. I'll be coming back to this trial later, so remember the plastic sleeve. The equipment that they would have collected um, in their investigations doesn't make it into the archives. Um, we don't tend to find that. Um, but it's described in a lot of detail in the police reports. So molds, for example, the molds that they would have poured the, the metal into are very commonly described. Uh, one defendant talks about how he poured, put a little sand into a wooden frame that was found in his house and he would press the good coin into that. I have lots of descriptions of molds made out of lead. Um, one strange one where the investigator insisted it was made out of fish scales. So I can't quite picture that, but maybe it was just a little, a little round mold, I'm not sure. Um, different chemical components are described as well. 
So in a 1735 case in Brittany, we find an empty envelope with the trial documents. And on the outside of the envelope, it says, piece of paper in which there was vifargent, so quicksilver or mercury. So they had a little sample of the mercury originally. And I was reading just recently an interrogation on another case. The defendant is asked about a certain powder found among his possessions, the color of sugar, which is used to melt metals. And in the interrogation, the defendant replies that it actually was sugar. Uh, and he brings it with him to put in his brandy, and it's good for stomach aches and colds. <laughs> uh, none of the court personnel seemed willing to test the sugar to make sure it was sugar. They just sort of left it alone. Um, sometimes I luck out, and I get an entire list of the counterfeiter's arsenal. So this document lists what was found in a 1742 raid of the ship's cabin where two sailors were making counterfeit coins. Uh, we read various pieces of tin and lead, some of which are partially melted, shavings from lead or tin objects, a square of tin folded in a triangle to make a crucible, which appears to have melted tin at the bottom, and an iron spoon for melting lead, an imprint of two stamps um, with a laurel wreath, two stars, and the letters B, D, and the year 1700, a semicircular file without a handle, and most crucially, four false coins that appear to have a core of tin and lead. So this is um, you know, very, very professional, very, uh, very well done. Oftentimes it's much less legible than that and kind of scrawled on the back of a, of a napkin. But, um, but the investigators did keep good records. Um, these coins here were actually discovered in a raid on a workshop in Toulouse, uh, along with various metals, uh, various molds unidentified powders. Um, the police officials noted the molding flash. So you can see here how there's, especially on this one, on this one a little bit too, where it's, this is if you poured it into a mold, right, this would be the part that would, that would uh, extend over the mold. And because it was, it was like that, it showed that the coins were unfinished, that they'd been produced illegally. So this was very, very damning evidence indeed. Um, the investigators were helped along in their task by the population at large, uh, who had a lot of experience dealing with fake coins and identifying them. After all, they weren't sitting in a well-lit police station, you know, carefully comparing specimens. Usually the victim was a busy seller at a marketplace, um, somebody working in a dark tavern, tired, you know, harried with lots of customers, and yet they still, they had this job where they had to, to estimate the coins. Um, they often tell police about the look of the coin, first of all. Uh, for example, I mentioned that pouring coin, pouring metal into a sand mold makes the impression quite blurry, kind of, kind of granular. So, and sometimes you'd get uh, air bubbles as well, so that was a sure giveaway. Um, hand striking could pr produce sort of, you know, after effects. If they struck twice and it shifted a little bit, then it was visually, visually damaged. And color also comes into it. So. I was talking about the chemical recipes, but copper that's been treated with nitric acid actually still retains some red and, and sort of brown undertones. It's not completely, uh, not completely gold colored. And tin that has been treated to look like silver also still retains some yellow undertones. So people got very good at estimating these things because their livelihood depended on it, right? These are the coins that they're gonna feed their family with. So if they're not gonna accept them, they have to make a decision pretty quickly. Uh, victims also describe the feel of the coin. Uh, tin apparently feels soapy. I don't know if anyone can attest to that. Uh, it's also softer than silver. In fact, all of these cheaper metals are softer than gold and silver. Um, brass, lead, tin. And popular wisdom suggested that if you uh, scraped it with your fingernail or if you bit it, they talk about biting it to try to, to make an impression, then you would know that it wasn't silver or gold. Um, fake coins were often lightweight as well. Uh, they tended to be lighter weight. So that would at least tip somebody off to, to have a closer look. Um, finally, the sound of the coin was key. Uh, 18th century observers described good coins as ringing, sonant. Uh, and so they had this test they would do. They would throw the coin down on stone or on metal, and a good, tone, a good coin would have sort of a bright, silvery, ringing tone to it, whereas something that contained lead, especially, or tin, would have kind of a muted sound, more of a dull tone. So I have a couple of stories here. Uh, in one case, two cousins attempted to pay a bill with a coin worth four crowns. And the merchant, and this is a quote from the trial, after having made three coins ring, found a fourth that gave no sound and pronounced it false. And the cousins actually took off at that point and left the three good ones there, <laughs> and the police uh, scooped up all of it. Um, and in another scenario, a man entered the boutique of Francoise Aubas, uh, looking to buy a half pound of soap with his coin, which was worth six crowns. Uh, Francoise told the stranger that his coin was fake, she could tell, and then to make sure 
the interrogation reads, she compared it to another one from her cash drawer, throwing first one down and then the other on the counter. And the coin she'd taken from her cash drawer produced a nice tone, but the other one made no sound at all. So these are some sort of popular lore for how to, how to detect uh, counterfeit coins. Eventually, cases like this went to trial, and it was time for the judge to determine guilt or innocence. So in his toolbox, he has the police investigator's notes, he has the opinions of the victims and the witnesses and the bystanders. Luckily, he has another tool in his toolbox, which is expert reports. So just like doctors were called in to pronounce on the cause of death in the case of a murder or to you know, describe what had happened in an injury, um, goldsmiths, engravers, um, specialists for the mint were called in to examine coins in cases of counterfeiters. So for example, in a 1766 trial uh, here against, uh, oh, this is the 1752 one. I apologize, I'm thinking of a different, uh, uh, I, I put up a different image for the actual report. But my story is about uh, La Cour, uh, Michel Lacour and Jean Galinier who were in Toulouse in the 1760s. And they brought in experts to test their coins, uh, an assayer, a, a, a verifier from the mint, um, and a senior goldsmith. And all of the testimony to that point, all of the witnesses had said, these coins are made of tin, definitely tin. And the experts write this long report, six pages, and they confirm, first of all, that the coins contain no gold or silver. But then they say they're actually made of lead, tin, and some steel filings. And they said the steel is there to harden them and to give them some tonality. So this is a sophisticated operation where they're trying to, to beat that, that sound test, right? Um, furthermore, they say that they, they noticed the addition of the steel filings because of remnants of steel that were left on the rim of the coupelle. So this tells us that it was actually a very sophisticated investigation. They'd used a chemical process called coupellation, which is where the sample is melted in a shallow earthenware uh, vessel known as a coupelle in order to separate the component metals. So as you can see in the image on the left, I don't know if it's a little bit small there, um, heating the mixture oxygenates the lead and the copper and it's going to pass through the, the porous uh, vessel. And that leaves the precious metal, silver in this case, behind. So this is the most sophisticated, the most uh, thorough method of testing suspected counterfeits, but it's only really used um, by the experts. This image actually is two of the coins that were on that very first page, the cover sheet that you guys were looking at for so long. And we can tell that these ones were tested, so they would clip out these little bits, and that's what would be melted in the, in the coupelle to test them. Not all expert witnesses went to this length, though. Their reports can vary from many pages to a few lines. Um, they all say, we made an exact verification, and we were very attentive, and they swear an oath to God and country and their conscience that everything is correct. In the end, I did a, I did a paper, I did a, a study of these expert reports, and I expected to find that they sometimes you know, justified the coins, that they overturned people's opinions of them, and in fact, they don't. In fact, the, the common knowledge on the street was very, very accurate. Uh, people were recognizing the counterfeits, and the experts really just confirmed it. And I came to the conclusion that it's almost more of a procedural box for the judge to check. It's almost more like this is a capital crime, we're going to execute this person. So they want to make really sure before the execution that the coins are in fact false. And I think that that's actually what's going on with the expert reports. But they are great for historians who have a secret love for chemistry and uh, who want to geek out on understanding exactly why these coins were made the way they were. Anyway, when I'm not trying to understand how they isolated silver with, a, with an earthenware cup, um, I'm fascinated by the stories themselves because in addition to police reports and expert testimony and judges' decisions and trial documents, um, they contain these glimpses into the daily lives of people who lived 300 years ago. Um, some of the crime stories uh, can be fascinating, somewhere between sort of a, a true crime blog and like a Monty Python sketch. <laughs> I mean, honestly, these are the ones who got caught. Some of them really are not that bright. Um, the typical monetization scheme was to pay for an inexpensive item with a high value coin and then get a bunch of real coins back in, in exchange. That was, that was the most common uh, thing. So we see this happening largely at marketplaces, especially at big rural fairs where they would gather in people from the surrounding countryside um, because the shopkeepers wouldn't expect to recognize all of their customers. So it was easier to get away with it. Um, there's also a large number of cases of false coins being used in taverns and bars. Uh, but I suspect that's because the French spent a lot of time in taverns and bars. <laughs> and, you know, 
the people in the lower classes, that was one of the main things they wanted to spend their money on. So that's where they tried to spend their false money. Um, so this case, for example, is typical. Uh, François Brélivet is a farmer. He also sells livestock. He goes to the fair in Plonitz in, uh, in Brittany to buy a cow. And he's stopped by the crowd because he's trying to get change for a six livre coin that they say is not good. So that's a standard one. He's trying to get change for his coin. In another case, and here I'm going to go back to this picture, um, this is uh, in the Dordogne in the southwest. Um, a man named Combi um, tries to pay a debt of five pounds with this coin, which if it had been true would have been worth 20 pounds. So he's trying to pay his debt and also get 15 pounds back. Um, Unfortunately for him, he does it in a tavern where there's lots and lots of people. It's a busy day, and so there's lots of second opinions on this coin, lots of people to help out the barmaid uh, with it. Um, so um, they all offer their opinions. The witnesses called it the so-called Louis, you know, this prétendu Louis. Um, and everyone agreed that it did not seem to be genuine. Uh, in fact, it's referred to as a yellow token. And the case is incomplete. I suspect that he ran off and they didn't complete the trial. Um, we don't know what happened to him, but we do know what happened to his coin. His coin is still here with his trial. And what's fascinating about this, and I talk about criminals not being all that bright, I mean, this is what the coin should have looked like, right? You can see this is you know, a reasonable facsimile of, of, of Louis XV's portrait there. This, however, is a fairground token. Okay, so he has literally taken a token and only stamped one side of it. <laughs> I don't know if he kind of passed it like this and hoped that maybe no one would turn it over, but, uh, but yeah, that's, um, that he, was, he was likely to get caught for that one. Um, the excuses can actually be really entertaining. Uh, the most common excuse that I read is, I didn't know they were false, or I received some of them in change myself and I didn't, uh, I didn't look closely. Sometimes people say they found the coins. Uh, for some reason, people think that finding a little bag of money in the ditch or on the mountainside is a believable excuse because people leave bags of money around all the time. Um, in one case, a man testified, those coin molds that you found weren't mine. A man I don't know came to the house for three to four hours and made some false coins. Then he left and said he'd come back, but he didn't. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and then there's François's excuse. So François Brélivet was the, the, the farmer with the, that wanted to buy the cow. He said he got the coins at another fair, a nearby one at Plomerdien, uh, and it was the previous May, so this would have been almost a year before, which is a little odd. He said he received the coins in payment when he sold some yarn, uh, and he took the coins without examining them because they appeared good to him. Uh, and then there's the punchline. He said, if they appear black at the moment, it's because they were in a fire as the village I was living in burned last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> the kicker here is the expert report actually came back that they were genuine. So he might have actually been telling the truth about the fire in the village. It sounds like something my students would tell me to get out of finishing a paper. You know, <laughs> The apartment I was living in burned last Thursday. I'm sorry, I don't have my paper. No, off no offense, guys. So what's interesting to me is that it's, it's actually relatively rare for people to say, you know, I was desperate, I didn't have enough to eat, so I tried this. Like, no one actually owns up to this, I guess because it is a capital crime, so, you know, they're going to do what they can, but their excuses really are quite pathetic. But I actually think poverty is one of the main underlying motivators for this crime, which brings me to my next slide. Who were these counterfeiters, right? And I'm also going to debunk another false impression here because the great majority of defendants were poor commoners. These were not big criminal organizations. These were not noblemen held up in their castles with you know, uh, an entire staff making coins for them. Uh, recently, I did a survey of the professions of all the defendants in my sample. And it confirms that counterfeiting, first of all, was practiced at all levels of society, but particularly at the lower end. Uh, defendants were often of the lower classes, a couple of guys at most, you know, running a very low-tech operation, very amateur. Um, these were, you know, jacks of all trade. They did a little laboring, a little charcoal burning, a little melting of, you know, base metals when they could get away with it. Overall, this is what we're looking at. Oh, that's <laughs> so strange. Um, so we have, okay, well, um, artisans and um, urban dwellers uh, should be 35% here. Peasants is right at 30%. This is so bizarre. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly which ones, which ones these are. So one of them is uh, merchants and quite, even quite wealthy sort of bourgeois merchants. And uh, so at about 15%. And another 15% is um, the real sort of marginal population. So peddlers, 
um, unemployed, uh, people who don't have a place to live, um, as well as uh, soldiers that have been decommissioned and, and people like that. That's sort of our marginal category. And then the last 6% is what we might consider elite. So nobility, maybe doctors, people who have a certain level of education. So as you can see, more than half is rural and urban lower classes, and even more if we include our marginal population. So here's a typical story from, the, from those lower classes. This is the case of Jean Porcher um, and Olivier Giquel. They live in the village of Plumoga in, Br in Brittany. La Roche is a boiler maker, okay, so he's a metal worker and he's the principal defendant. His accomplice, Giquel, has, uh, he says initially, um, the, the trial reads that he has no visible means of making a living. Um, when the royal prosecutor pushes him, he describes his profession as normally looking about for old rags to make paper with. So they come together on this scheme. They're indicted in 1726 for making and trying to unload false coins at the tavern of La Bonté in exchange for some cider, because this is Brittany, after all, they're drinking cider. Um, the tavern keeper was immediately suspicious, and he has a friend who happens to be in town. He's an official from a nearby town, and so he comes to his help, to his aid. He tricks La Roche into showing his hand by pretending that he too is a counterfeiter, and he brags about how many coins he makes with his father. And so La Roche totally bites and says, oh no, I wake, make way more counterfeit coins than you, and, and they arrest them. Um, so the pair, <laughs> once again, not that bright. Um, the pair was searched. Uh, counterfeit coins were recovered from their pockets and their shoes. Uh, their satchels were found to contain coin ma molds made out of stone and wood, including one with imprints top and bottom, iron tools, pieces of pewter. Uh, Jaquel is pardoned because it's recognized that he had a very minor role. La Roche is hanged. So these people feel very real to me. Okay, um, I was discussing the project with uh, a French colleague, Marc Lapron, uh, in the Department of French at UVic, and uh, we just passed him in the hall and he asked what I was working on, and he wasn't surprised about this at all. <laughs> He's French. Um, he said, of course, ils se démerdent comme ils peuvent. They, 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 they get themselves out of trouble however they can. Ils se démerdent. Um, for him, this was a French trait, right, that they would be doing what they could, and if they get caught, they try to get themselves out of trouble. He said, you know, they're individualistic, they're, they're pragmatic, they're, they're all about their own survival. Okay, one last thing that I find surprising uh, about this sample of trials is the significance of women uh, in counterfeiting operations, and it's something I think we wouldn't have expected. Um, on the one hand, it's sort of a workshop-based crime, right? Uh, so women are always going to be involved as bystanders, and I think that that's what many historians have assumed, is that they're sort of, they're passive observers or they're, they're obliged to help in some way as the sister, you know, partner, um, uh, daughter of, of, the, of the counterfeiter. But in my sample, it's not just, you know, wives, servants, daughters, relatives. 25% uh, of the trials contain female defendants, and a small number of cases, women are the principal or even the only defendants. So I have, an, I think, eight or ten trials where it's a pair of women working together, a couple of, you know, a mother-daughter, uh, an aunt and a, and a, and a niece working together. Um, so consider the case, for example, of Antoinette Chenevez. She's a cobbler's wife from Lyon, and she and her aunt are accused of, of passing off fake coins. Um, there's three sellers of secondhand goods in Marseille. They're all married, but the three women are working together, and they give counterfeit coins in change when people buy things from them. Um, even in mixed groups, when it comes to sentencing, women are not really being shielded from harm. There's also an assumption in historical studies that um, women would uh, even be put forward by the men they're working with because it's thought that you know they'll get they'll get away with it. They won't be hanged. But in 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 my experience, that is not really the case. Well, let me tell you one last story because this one has a happy ending. Uh, in the town of Brast, so this is a port on the Atlantic coast, uh, the public prosecutor is investigating some reports of nighttime thievery. And he receives a tip that there's a group of women, uh, they're all the wives of sailors who are not in port right now, and they are carousing about the town, getting drunk every day, and flashing around a lot of money. So he searches the home of the one who is reported to be the most suspect of the lot. Uh, her name is Marguerite Alexandre, and he finds in her home a lead mold and four false coins. So Marguerite is stopped and interrogated. What does she do for a living, he asks. She buys old clothes, bleaches and fixes, and resells them to get by. Who made the mold for her, he says. So there's this assumption, right? She couldn't have done it herself. Um, who taught her how to make the coins? So she's smart. She says, no, I've never made false coins. I found the mold and the four coins on the mountainside. 
Once again, there's the mountainside excuse. I really don't understand that. Um, she does say cleverly that she had intended to make them into spoons, which is why they're, they're still in her possession. Then we hear from witnesses, uh, the barkeeper where she tried to pay her tab, uh, and a woman who loaned her money. In the second case, um, <laughs> the woman looks at the coin that Marguerite offers and says, this is made of lead. And she cuts it with a pocket knife to prove that it's made of lead. And Marguerite bluffs. She says, well, that's not surprising. Silver can be cut with a pocket knife. And she takes a silver ashtray, and she takes the woman's knife, and she tries to cut the silver ashtray, and she can't. <laughs> so then she takes off. And the next time we see her, she's in the courtroom. Um, so she's, you know, she's not going down easy here. Uh, throughout her trial, she keeps her head. Uh, she dodges the prosecutor's attempts to trip her up. And they actually end up dropping the charge of making false coins. Uh, and she d gets downgraded to just using false coins. But the sentence is still death by hanging. So this is what really impressed me about Marguerite. She knows that she can appeal it. And not all of them do. There's an automatic, there's, a, there's, an, uh, there's an, uh, a guaranteed right of appeal from this particular court. And so she, she demands that right. She says, I wish to appeal my sentence. And she goes to the Supreme Court, and her death penalty is commuted to banishment for life um, outside of the kingdom, which for her is actually quite a good outcome. It turns out that she's from just um, by the eastern border, so towards the German-speaking lands. And uh, so she returns home. And that's the end of the story. So I've reached the end of my time, and I'm the person who would normally be pulling me off with a hook. <laughs> so I'll move to my last slide. It is the question that hangs over every researcher's head. Uh, it's the question that our students hate to hear us ask after a presentation. So why does this matter? So what, right? What does this history of counterfeiting teach us? What can we glean from these people's stories? They're interesting, certainly. I hope you enjoyed them. Um, they tell us a lot about everyday life, uh, how it functioned in the 18th century. They talk about workplaces and relationships and, you know, what it was like to live in a one-room shack and what it was like to be a judge or an expert. Um, and historians have actually used court documents for a long time uh, for indirect evidence. So people who study um, literacy, for example, will go through court documents and see how many people could sign their names. Uh, people who study you know, old professions will look at you know, how many people in a given city say that they're of a certain profession. But thinking back to my title, so the preoccupations of the king, the courts, did these men and women threaten to topple the French state? Part of me wants to say no. Okay, um, these are real people. They're caught up in real life situations. This is a time with very little safety net for the poor. Uh, there's a few handouts by the church, not much. There's no social policy from the government to speak of. Uh, the economy is unforgiving. Uh, crop yields are poor. Uh, we're in a time of early globalization, so artisans who manufacture things are being threatened by cheaper products from elsewhere. There's very little upward social mobility. This is before the revolution. If you're not a nobleman, you can't move up. Um, so they're faced with difficult circumstances, and these people find a way to literally make money. So, you know, I have a grudging respect for them. There's, there's some ingenuity here. You know, like my French colleague, right, Issa de Melt, they're, they're getting by. And yet, if we return to the history of money, we know that the most important thing about money is that people have faith in it, right? It can be made of grain or shells or feathers or gold or paper, as long as that confidence is maintained. And in this era of precious metal currency, where part of that faith comes from the intrinsic value of the coin, and the other part comes from the government's ability to maintain it and to, to uphold that currency, I would say that the king had it about right, actually. Um, undermining public faith in the coinage did undermine his sovereignty. I can see the charge. Now, was he right to have people boiled alive or even hanged? You know, that's a question for a different talk. So, um, last slide, a big thank you to my research assistant. So, my mother, Heather Masiak, who everyone can wave to, she's back there at the back table. <laughs> my mother has uh, accompanied me on a number of research trips on this project, and she is my photographer in the archives. So, she is familiar with the chicken feathers and the coins and the fabric and everything else, and, uh, and she does a great job helping me out with my project. So, thank you very much. I guess I'll field my own questions. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yeah. Um, in some ways, it doesn't surprise me that, uh, um, that the, the distribution of, of 
Right. Yeah. 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 I think I think there's uh, there's some truth to that. I think there's. Sorry, the question was um, that in some ways it it doesn't seem surprising the the social distribution of of the perpetrators uh, because those who were you know who might have had a better chance of success because they have the wherewithal, the means to, to do a really successful job, you know, they might not want to risk the death penalty and there's a large number of people who are extremely poor who might who might make the risk. Um, I, think th I think that that's true. I wish that I had better data from the defendants on why they did it. Like I would give anything if the, if the interrogations were honest. You know, if, if, when I actually get someone, I, had, I was reading about a woman who said, you know, I'm destitute, I you know, was thrown out of my lodgings, my children are sleeping on straw. You know, I can understand her. Like, I, I know where she's coming from, but it's, it, most of them aren't honest. Most of them are just trying to get away from it, just trying to get out of the charges, right? So I, I do wish I had more information about that. Um, I think you're right. It's just that um, at the same time, um, I th there are stories of you know big of big counterfeiting rings, especially on the frontiers. Right, they smuggle them across the frontiers. There's a lot of tobacco smuggling in this period. There's salt smuggling. Salt was taxed. Salt was an extremely expensive commodity, and so you smuggled salt from an area where it wasn't taxed to a place where it was. Um, calico was smuggled. I mean, cartouche and mandarin. These 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 big smugglers were were big. So I mean, there are counterfeiters that are that are tied up in in those kind of circles. So I guess I just expected more counterfeiting to be of that of that level. Um, one of the things about the little guys trying it is that, and I didn't go into this in the talk, but people are actually relatively easygoing about it when they get false coins. You would think that the reaction would be to immediately call the police, you know, to grab the guy by the scruff of the neck and hold on to him and get the police there. But it's it's actually much more of a community reaction than that. Um, much more often, um, the reaction is, hey, this coin you gave me is false. Uh, I'd like a good one instead, please. And if they're willing to take it back, then there's no harm, no foul. So maybe it's also that, that locally, you know, they think they might be able to get away with it a little bit. So, yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, isn't it all counterfeit? <laughs> the the government is is uh, is assigning a, an arbitrary value to it, um, and and uh, and they're 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 tampering essentially with the value of the coinage as well. And I mean, and that's been going on for a very 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 long time, right? The Romans were the first to devalue their currency, uh, you know, intentionally, and uh, and to try to cheat uh, the the population by saying, no no no, this is still you know is still so much silver and in fact it was 10% less and 20% less and next year it was 50% less and they kept pocketing the difference so absolutely and um, there are there are um, there are incidences of governments being involved in in coin manipulation but that's where it comes down to what's really interesting is I mean we accept the $20 bill we look at the exchange rates we look at inflation we look at you know how the economy is doing we know what that 20 should buy um, we don't have any sense of, you know, whether this 20 is better than the other 20. 
right? There's no, there's no comparison there. These people are, they're dealing with such a huge variety of coins in circulation. You're absolutely right. Even the official ones, you know, are going to be probably a little bit lightweight, um, probably not quite what the face value says. Um, half of what they're seeing is, is clipped. Half of it's filed down. Um, some of them are probably counterfeit. It would be interesting to be able to estimate somehow, um, you know, maybe through a cache in, a, in a, an archaeological find or something like that, like what proportion. I know they've done that for ancient coin caches where they, they show that, you know, 30% of these coins are actually counterfeit, right? So I, th I, think, I think you're right. I think that there is a huge variety of value among the coins that are in circulation. And that's why, the, you know, they have to think about it when they're, when they're accepting things. Hi, yeah. Absolutely, yes, everywhere. I would like to say that the French were craftier or, or, or less good at, at escaping detection or something like that, but no, it's absolutely everywhere, for sure. Um, especially, especially border countries, um, like borderlands areas, everywhere we see that. Um, the Isle of Guernsey in this period of time is, is rife with counterfeiters because it's sort of out of the reach of, of the British monarchy. Um, Switzerland, um, uh, the Spanish Netherlands, um, huge amounts of counterfeiting. Yeah, I think I think it really is just about the the um, the lack of consistency in official coins, the lack of consistency in coins out there, the lack of literacy in the population, right? The lack of ability to to standardize them, right? These are not coins that are produced by a mechanical, you know, press the way quarters and loonies are today, right? They're they're not even the best of them are not uniform. So um, there's uh, I think there's a lot of attempting this. I think it's a. I think it's open season on currency, to be honest. Yeah. Yes, John. Um, well, you do raise the, the point that sometimes the difference between being part of the making and the passing coins, and I can imagine lots of people ownership of the passing of coins. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so, does that sense ever work, or is that all automatically built into the whole area? No, it does. It does. I mean, and that's what when you're charged with just um, passing coins, and that's the defense that they use that they didn't know. And so there's there's an attempt to determine whether um, whether it's intentional, and that's always what it what it hinges on. And I think that I would say it's about fifty fifty. I think a lot of times people still get charged with it, and it's surprising actually, especially as time goes on. There's particular times where um, where the the government is more vulnerable for whatever reason, a political change or um, uh, a reformation in the currency or, or some, some reason why they're cracking down on counterfeiting. And at those times, they will enforce the death penalty on people who are just caught using counterfeit coins. Absolutely. Yeah? Did you say that there were low denominational coins counterfeited as well that might have been used? Yeah, and that's actually something I'm working on right now. I'm working on going through all the trials and saying, OK, what is the value we're talking about here? Right, like uh, if we added up all the coins that you're accused of of holding, are we talking about you know a bunch of gold and louis, or are we talking about a bunch of pennies? Um, and they did they did counterfeit the 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 little coins um, as well. In fact, I, I actually don't see as much of the of the higher denomination ones as I do of the of the ones that are just easier to pass. So are you sure it's 1955? Because during the war years, 42, 43, 44, a lot of coins were made out of aluminum because the nickel was used for, for military reasons. David, you can probably back me up on this, right? Steel. 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 They were made out of steel? Nickel oh. steel. Nickel steel, OK. Yeah, the, the, the materials were, were needed. So it, it's strange that it would be 55, but it might be a counterfeit. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about lightweight. <laughs> well, if it's 1955, then yes, it is. That would be a pretty obvious um, lightweight metal to uh, to use. Oh, another question? <laughs> you can ask me in class. <laughs> okay. The question is about the, um, the the sort of lack of seriousness with which some people, like some of the community, would take counterfeit coins. Like if they saw them, they wouldn't they wouldn't react very very badly to them. And was there ever like so little faith in the coins that people returned to barter? Um, what's interesting is what I, I to a certain extent um, not pure barter to answer your question, but um, 
what I do think is that in areas, especially I see this, I was working on a project for a while um, on the, the, the borderlands between France and Spain. So, um, you know, small villages up in the mountains, they're mostly shepherds. There's like, it's not a huge, you know, monetary economy. And, uh, and it seemed like that was a place where people were particularly permissive of, of small counterfeit coins. They didn't really care. And it was almost that um, they had sort of reverted to their use as tokens. Right, so if, if I you know, accept this coin from you, it's because I know that my neighbors feel the same way and I'm gonna be able to spend it at the marketplace as well. So it, it almost becomes an exchange token again, which is what's interesting, right? I mean, if we accept counterfeits, then it doesn't really matter as long as you accept them when I pay for something. You know, that's, it comes down to money can be anything. Money can be anything as long as you and I agree that it's money. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the quotes in the children's book that I use when I'm teaching is, if one kid has a water gun and the other kid offers three pieces of bubble gum for it and they agree, then at that moment, bubble gum is money and one water gun is worth three pieces of bubble gum. So that's all it is to it, right? It's just it's just about the, the acceptance. Yeah? yeah? I believe that some people that are uh, went into a lot of war believe that there is enormous amount of money mm -hmm. where the value of the coin is scaled off. Absolutely not. Very good question. Um, Louis XIV and all of his wars, um, who spent you know astronomical sums and bankrupted the state, and in fact you know laid the groundwork for the French Revolution. Um, so Louis XIV um, started a little bit what the Romans had done too when the Roman Empire was starting to falter. Uh, what they called reformation, reformation of the coinage, which is where they would uh, recall all the coins, pull them all back in, and then reissue them with less precious metal content and the same face value and they would pocket the difference. So if they said, you know, now it has 5% less gold in it, and that's a 5% profit that the state just made. And so they would do this over and over again, and, um, and it got to the point, this is one of the reasons in answering John's question, this is one of the reasons why, um, why they cracked down on counterfeiters, because every time they did this, every time there was a, a refresh of the currency, it was, it was open season for the counterfeiters because nobody really knew what the official ones were supposed to feel like yet. So they would, they would um, and they would also do what they called false reformations, where they would they'd be absolutely authentic. They would look just like the, 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 the real ones, but they were the ones pocketing the difference in the 5% gold. And so, yeah. Technically, it was just as just as legitimate as the state coin, but because it hadn't been produced by the state, it was still considered a counterfeit. So yes, um, Louis the Sixteenth tampered quite a bit with the currency. He died in 1715, so the war Spanish success ended in 1713, and there was a regency for a number of years, and that was a t time period in which the, the 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 state of French finances were so bad that they hired a Scottish um, banker, John Law, to essentially. <laughs> to uh, to fix the situation, and what he did was he invented a pyramid scheme in which he got people to invest in false land in the Mississippi, <laughs> and he uh, <laughs> he sold shares in the Mississippi company, and it was a it was it was massive. It it produced a huge amount of money for the state until it burst, and uh, and he was uh, chased away to to England. Um, he actually hired unemployed people to march through the streets of Paris looking like they were going off to the Mississippi with like pitchforks over their shoulders and stuff just to give people confidence that this was actually a real a real thing. Um, so, so that happened in 1720, 1721, 1722 and then when we get Louis XV coming in on, in 1723 it's that that's when we see a real sort of trying to, to, to solidify the currency in the late 1720s and so then most of the 18th century is more stable after that but but yes, he definitely undermined the stability of the currency. Another question? Yeah, on the counterfeit coins, I at some point did research as to the worst coins that people have to pay for. Because I know that the barrel coin is the, the greater of the nine. So it's said to have been worth between more money and a little less to say it's been worth less. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. Um, I don't think it's quite as early as the 19th century. Um, but uh, th there's actually a really um, big trade in counterfeit ancient Sorry, the question was: Is there a point? At, was there a point at which counterfeit coins became valuable to collectors and actually became worth more than the originals? Um, there's quite a robust trade in ancient counterfeits, so um, ancient Greek, ancient Roman, um, and and other uh, and other populations. Um, and 
and yes, actually, some of my information <laughs> comes from a coin collector's website uh, called the Compte Général Bancaire de France. It's uh, cgb.fr. And they, it's, it's actually quite a remarkable historical site. They have cataloged all the coins from all the different reigns, and then they have some that are for sale, and so they'll show you the counterfeit ones and they'll compare them. Some of the uh, comparisons that I have, you might have noticed, are from that site. So, um, so yes, uh, they are, they're very valuable, uh, in fact, and, and, and of, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a, a point of fascination for, for coin collectors. I'm not sure when that started. You know, um, I guess it's possible it would have been as early as the 19th century, but I think we'd have to look at sort of the history of, of coin collecting, and it's probably kind of a late 19th century phenomenon. Okay, in good French fashion, I would like to finish my wine, so <laughs> I'm going to thank myself very much for the talk, and uh, <laughs> thank you, my audience, uh, for coming. Thank you.